Genesis is one of America's newest luxury brands and honestly the one that I find the most intriguing because Genesis has come so far in such a short time very much like their parent company, Hyundai. The Genesis experiment started back in 2008. That's when Hyundai created their first mid-size luxury sedan. But back then, Hyundai was trying to go in a different direction than Toyota did with Lexus back in the 1980s. They were attempting to create luxury vehicles that were branded as Hyundais, but sub-branded as something else. So we had the Genesis and then we had the full-size Equus. Then at some point later, Hyundai realized that that wasn't really going to work, so they decided to branch everything off into the Genesis brand itself. Now, a lot of folks don't realize this, but that had a large part to do with the fact that the Genesis sold incredibly well. And that statement doesn't really matter how you want to categorize that first generation Genesis sedan, because whether you wanted to stick it in the same category as the Dodge Charger or the Chrysler 300, it sold well, and whether you want to call it an E-Class or 5 Series competitor, it still sold well. But unquestionably, the last two generations of G80 have been solid E-Class 5 Series competitors, and that's becoming even more obvious with this now third generation model. I suppose I should get the bad news out of the way right up front. I won't be able to drive this on public roads. This is an early production prototype version of the G80, and apparently due to the way that it was imported, they're not able to put license plates on it, they're not able to register it in the US, so this cannot be driven on public roads. However, I live on a private road, so we will be driving it just a very brief while here on a private road. Unfortunately, it's not paved. So if you want to know the full drive experience, you'll have to wait, unfortunately, for probably a few months until I can get my hands on this again. Uh, of course, not this particular one, a different one that is actually properly registered in the United States. The first thing to know about the G80 for 2021 is that this is almost an entirely new vehicle. It shares the same wheelbase with the outgoing model, but really none of the structure, none of the suspension. We get different engines under the hood, a completely different interior, new infotainment systems, new instrument clusters, new active safety systems. Really only the eight speed automatic transmission is the same. But obviously the first thing you're gonna notice is this striking new design that we first saw previewed with the refreshed G90 sedan. It has this Superman like grill right here with this strong point right there. It's definitely more distinctive than what we've seen from Genesis before. The other thing that struck me when I parked these two vehicles next to one another is just how much more refined the G80 feels now than the G70. And again, the G70 is not very old and it's still very competitive in its segment, but the G80 really is pushing forward for Genesis. The other thing that struck me when I parked these two vehicles next to one another are just the little things in the G80's design. The way the hood meets the front quarter panels, the way the grill and everything integrates in the front end, it's definitely a more cohesive design than we've seen from Genesis before. The new G80 and GV80 are launching the new Genesis key right over here on the right. This is the previous generation Genesis key. This one's from a Genesis G70. You can see it has Genesis logo right there on the back like the new key, but the materials are not quite as premium. It has sort of a rougher finish right there on the front and it just feels a little bit less nice, I guess, than this key right here. We also have some new buttons because this key features their new remote parking feature. We can lock the vehicle. We can then auto start it right there by pressing that little button. And we can then park and unpark the vehicle. So we can press this button right here. And the G80 gets ever closer. Hopefully it won't run us over. Let's see if it stops in time. Ooh, there we go, it stopped, that was a risk. And then we can press the back button, have it pull out of the parking spot. And there it goes away from us. It will also parallel park and unparallel park itself. So this is different than the system that we find in the Hyundai Sonata, for instance, more similar to what we find in the Nexo. The interesting thing about these headlights is that the low beams are up here, two modules for the low beams, and then the high beams are in a separate module down below. So the quad beam headlights are actually in two separate bits that are completely surrounded by bumper and quarter panel. One thing that I wish Genesis would change, however, is this radar cruise control sensor right here in the middle of the grill. It has the same design as the rest of the grill, but it certainly sticks out a little bit more than some of the adaptive cruise control sensors that we find in the German competition. And interestingly enough, there are increasing numbers of vehicles out there that use the same system that we find in modern Volvos, where it's completely behind the windshield in the vehicle, and that leaves the front completely undisturbed. A really cool design touch up front is the way that the hood, the grille, and the quarter panels all meet one another. You can see that this quarter panel is below the level of the hood. It gives a sort of a tiered appearance right there, and this is the line where the hood opens right here. The hood goes all the way up to this sharp point where it meets the grille. This is kind of a classic design cue that we also see, for instance, in some Rolls Royces, but it's one that not too many luxury car manufacturers attempt because getting this seam perfect, because you can see it from so many different angles, is pretty difficult. At 196.7 inches long, this G80 is a hair longer than it's ever been before, but it is still solidly a mid-size luxury sedan. It's about two inches longer than a BMW 5 Series, which gives us a little bit more interior room, but three inches shorter than a Volvo S90. 
Genesis decided at the very beginning of things that they were going to fit right into the European luxury car segments. And that means that we don't find vehicles that are a half step larger or front wheel drive or different than what we find in the German competition, I guess would be the best way to say that. So we don't find, for instance, front wheel drive entries in the Genesis lineup. So their upcoming competitor to the Lexus RX is rear wheel drive like the BMW X5, not front wheel drive like the Lexus. And Genesis is not trying to give us tweener entries like sort of the Volvo S90, which is trying to compete not only in this segment, but also perhaps as an alternative to a Genesis G90 because it's nearly that big, even though it's theoretically a mid-sized luxury sedan, or the Cadillac lineup where they have an awful lot of vehicles that slot between segments. The design of the turn signals help tie the front, side, and rear of the G80 together. So we have those dual modules, those four LED beams with the two turn signals up front. Mimicking that, we have two turn signals right here on the side with some chrome strips that help highlight that during the day. And the rear turn signals wrap from the rear over to the side helping tie everything together. Moving to the rear, we certainly find a strong family resemblance between the G80 and the rest of the Genesis lineup. We again have those dual modules for the tail lamps, just like we found for the headlights. These are actually, I guess, quad lamps technically because we have separate modules over here in the trunk and then separate modules over here on the side. The tail lamps are full LEDs and there's definitely a 3D effect going on with these tail lamps, which I'm not quite clear whether we can really show you on camera, but they do have a really cool look to them. Now on the downside, the turn signals are red, they're not amber. If you want to buy Save the Amber Lamps gear, be sure and click that link down there in the description section. You'll be able to find all of our t-shirts, etc. We also have some styling cues from the front, like these pointy Superman-styled exhaust tips. Real gas flows through those. Those are not fake exhaust tips like we find in modern Audis. And then they mimic that styling right here with this little angle right there by the rear view camera. Under the hood, we have some big changes for 2021. There are no more naturally aspirated engines available in the G80. Instead, we get an all new base two and a half liter turbocharged four cylinder engine that produces 300 horsepower and 311 pound feet of torque, replacing both the five liter V8 and the outgoing 3.3 liter twin turbo six is an all new 3.5 liter twin turbo six. The V6 is the engine that we're taking a look at right now. This produces 375 horsepower and 391 pound-feet of torque. That may not seem like a huge bump over the outgoing 3.3 liter twin turbo six, but the way this engine produces its power is a little bit different. It has a broader horsepower and torque curve, so this is definitely going to be quicker than the outgoing model. It also may not seem to be too much of an improvement over the old five liter V8, but this engine is lighter, and the car itself is lighter as well. It's lost about 275 pounds, so this is probably going to be faster than the five liter V8, Although, unfortunately, we can't zero to 60 test this guy because I can't get it to the private road that we use for zero to 60 testing, unfortunately. So you're gonna have to wait for that until the full review. If you're shopping for a G80 outside the United States in a country that loves diesel, there is also a small diesel engine, but it's not too exciting. 210 horsepower out of 2.2 liters. When it comes to active safety, Genesis is going about things a little bit differently than the European competition and a little bit more like Lexus. We have a whole host of active safety technologies standard on the G80 most of which are typically optional in the European competition. The G80 and the GV80 are getting the latest generation of these safety technologies from Genesis. The G70 and G90 are currently a generation behind. So this has their Highway Driving Assistant version two, which has more aggressive lane centering and will function in a broader variety of different situations. We also have the adaptive cruise control system now with machine learning to help it be more smooth. We also have the latest autonomous braking system from Genesis, which features pedestrian detection and now intersection assistance. So that way, if you're turning across traffic, the vehicle will attempt to stop if it senses a head-on collision is imminent. We also have the blind spot collision avoidance system, which not only detects things in your blind spot, but will help keep you from hitting them. And on the inside of the car, we have new airbag technology. There's an airbag on the inboard side of the driver's seat that will deploy between the driver and front passenger in the event that it thinks it's necessary to keep people from bopping heads. Front seat comfort is definitely excellent. This is an improvement over the current generation G80 and also oddly enough over the current G90. That's because we get a new driver's seat design that has a bit more range of motion than we find in that larger luxury sedan. We have the typical four-way adjustable lumbar support, inflatable side bolsters, extending thigh cushion, etc. But we also have an inflatable seat bottom cushion that can basically raise up or down. It's sort of like sitting on a medicine ball and inflating it or deflating it slowly pretty similar to what we find in the Lexus LS500. And then there's also what they call the ergo motion function over here on the driver's seat. That's a separate little button. You can think of this as the corollary to the BMW multi-contour seats. It's not quite front seat massage like we would find in a Lexus LS or the Volvo S90. Those are 
pretty aggressive front seat massage functions. However, this is a little bit more expansive than what we find in that BMW. It has a series of bladders in the seat bottom and seat back cushion that inflate and deflate to give you sort of a lumbar area massage and then a leg massage as well to help keep your circulation going. Unfortunately, the passenger seat still does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. As you can see, we get the four-way adjustable lumbar support, but we don't have the active massage functionality, the extending thigh cushion, etc. Thanks to the extra size of the G80 versus some of the European competition, we certainly have an accommodating rear seat area. We have probably about seven inches or so with that front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall. Now, when you take a look at legroom figures, it's important to remember that the G80, like most of the Genesis models, has front seat tracks that move a great deal further rearward. So if you're a taller driver or a taller front passenger, you may want to look at this rather than some of the European options because the front seats will move further rearward. Thanks to the profile of the G80, I still have a great deal of headroom. This is one of the few sedans in America that can really comfortably fit adults in the back. If I lean my head all the way back there to the cushy headrest, I have about an inch of headroom left. Now, if I move over here to the middle seat, obviously this is gonna be a little bit less comfortable because the outboard seating positions are definitely solidly bucket shaped. And here, I definitely don't have enough headroom. But if I move all the way over to the right side of the vehicle where this front seat was adjusted for a six foot five passenger, you can see I could very comfortably sit back here. And we have a lot of footwell space as well. A feature that we're starting to see in other Genesis models, we have little controls right here on the front passenger seat. So that way you can move that front seat further rearward and you can see really how far that seat moves back. That's a lot of leg room up front. Apparently there are a number of specifications that we're still waiting for on the G80. One of those is trunk volume. I suspect this is gonna be just over 16 cubic feet. It looks like a pretty big trunk. The hinges do take up some of that trunk space, but they're nicely secreted away behind those carpeted sections. And we do have a spare tire under the load floor. That's something that we don't find in a lot of the European competition. Now I suspect it's possible that this cargo area as a result of that spare tire may end up being a little bit smaller than some of the Euro options, but if you did want to remove it, you could put extra stuff down there. As we see in a lot of luxury cars, we don't find folding rear seat backs, although there is a ski pass-through, and we do have a power trunk lid. Oh, there's also LED lighting in here. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in essentially the top end trim, so obviously the lower end trims aren't gonna have everything that we see here, but the first thing you'll notice about this interior is that almost all of the parts in here are brand new. And everything has definitely been designed to look more premium than before. We have a lot of different textures going on here from the textures inside these lamp modules to you can see the dome light right there with that little hatch pattern. The front seats get high adjustable shoulder belts, four-way adjustable headrests. You can see those well-integrated side shades right back there for the rear passengers. And then we have a panoramic moonroof. There are two panels, a small one right there over the rear passengers, and then this large one right here over the front passenger area. As we see in much of the European competition, the base models get imitation leather seats, but the model that we're having has the upgraded upholstery. You can see we have a really interesting pattern right there on the seat back and on the seat bottom cushion. The center sections of these seats are perforated because these seats are both heated and ventilated. Now again, the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. I do think that's a bit of a pity. I wish we got identical seats in here. Moving over to the front door panels, we find a majority of soft touch materials. Really the only hard plastics you'll find are on the inside of that storage bin right there at the bottom of the door. Colors can sometimes be a little bit tricky on camera, but this is a two-tone interior. This is a navy blue middle section right there, not charcoal. And then we have sort of a chestnut brown lower and upper section of the door. As you'd expect in a luxury vehicle, there's a ton of open pore wood trim going on. We find new door handles right over there on the front of the door and also new door and window switches over here. So these are different than we've seen in Genesis models before. This model has the Lexicon sound system, so you can see a small Lexicon logo on that lower speaker grill. And then the dashboard design is very similar to what we see in the upcoming GV80 SUV. We have this enormous widescreen LCD right here on top. This is over 14 inches. This gives us smartphone integration. You can see Apple CarPlay working right there. And then on the driver's side, we'll take a look at that in a bit. We have another large LCD. That one's a 12 inch LCD and it offers 3D technology. Aside from that large infotainment screen, the other striking thing about this interior has to be this large expanse of open pore wood trim. It's really well integrated with the air vents right there. Since this is a new software package for Genesis, let's take a bit of a closer look. The system supports swipe gestures, so you can swipe across to the home screen or across to those other menu options right there. We have driving info, which is pretty typical. You get this sort of starting, stopping, driving, and idling graph right there, so you can see where all of your fuel is going. Obviously, there are a ton of options right here in the setup screen. We also have access to Genesis Connected Services. Now, this is a pre-production vehicle, so that's not active right now. If we hop into the climate control screen, you'll notice a few things that we haven't seen before. We have 
vents right up here above this infotainment screen. So you can choose whether you want the air to be a little bit more diffuse or not. And there are a ton of different modes here, including the recirculation plus mode activated upon washer fluid, etc. This system will also detect fine particulates in the air and automatically engage the recirculation function. Now, one thing you will notice that we are still lacking is a four zone climate control system. It's a three zone system. So the rear zone and then the front two zones. You'll also notice that I can see what the buttons on the driver's seat would do just by touching them. I'm not actually activating those buttons. I'm simply touching them. They are touch sensitive. And this is what the ergo motion seat display looks like. You can choose the whole body stretching option there. And then if we activate that and then we go into settings right here, you'll notice that we can also choose how long we want this to operate for. So unlike some of the ones that are out there that it won't operate very long, we can actually choose up to 20 minutes. You can also choose whether you want the driver's seat to adjust when you enter sport mode, and there's a posture assistant feature for longer car trips. The mapping software has not changed greatly, so the interface is very similar to what we've seen before, but obviously now it uses the entire screen. Below the band of wood trim, we find the controls for the climate control system. This is another touchscreen LCD right here, and this offers haptic feedback. So as I press the buttons, the screen will actually buzz. We have knobs right here for the temperature, and this is definitely a different look than we've seen before. Under the climate controls, we have a sliding cover that hides away the Qi wireless charger, the single USB input for the infotainment system. It is a USB 3 port and then a USB charge only port. There is enough room in there to, for those larger smartphones to exist with the cable connected. Over here, we have two large cup holders and they hide away right there under that wood cover. This is again the controller for that infotainment system. You can see the touch section right there in the middle, that rotary dial with a lot of knurled accents going on. There's volume right over here. There's a tune knob right over there. There's menu, home, and then back buttons for that infotainment system. Behind that, we have an all new rotary style shifter. This has a what looks like a glass or a acrylic top on it. So you can really see all of those details in there. And it's also illuminated. You can see the little glow. We rotate it around for drive right there, around that way for reverse, and then park is the button in the middle. There's also a button for the auto brake hold system. That's definitely an interesting look. I'm not sure whether I like the rotary shifter. I think I might prefer some of the T shifters that we've seen before. Uh, over here, we have a drive mode selector. This allows us to choose between comfort, sport, eco, and custom. The custom mode is adjustable via the infotainment display. We also have a button for the 360 degree camera system. This is one of the CRISPR 360 degree camera systems out there. If I press and hold the parking button, then we get the parking assist mode. So you can actually exit the vehicle, use the remote control and have it parallel park for you. In addition to the typical 360 degree view, we also have an interesting augmented reality view. That's really cool. So I can actually scroll over there and I can see, oh, my camera equipment's right there next to the car. And you can see a little bit greater detail of exactly what you're gonna be running into or running over as you go around the vehicle. You can see a bunch of stuff there in the background that I probably should have hidden a little bit better because it looks ugly. On the driver's side, we have a full LCD instrument cluster that's a little over 12 inches. And as you can see, the theme of the display changes based on the drive mode that you select with that drive mode button I showed you earlier. Now, what looks like sort of demon eyes right up here at the top of your camera, those are IR sensors. They're actually looking at your face, making sure you're looking at the road and, of course, at the display. These are not visible to the human eye, but they are visible to the camera. The system uses them also to engage the 3D mode on this instrument cluster, which is really cool, but unfortunately, I've not been able to actually film it with the camera. There's no real good way to show you what that looks like. But in a nutshell, what it does is it makes the needle really pop out and it makes the display right here, the numbers look like they're further back from the rest of the display. It's really noticeable if we go into the eco mode where there are a ton of different layers there in the display. And then this lower section right here is actually a little bit closer to the driver in appearance. Now you can disable the 3D functionality if you don't like it. You can just have it as a 2D display, but the 3D display is pretty cool. What's also interesting is if you look away from the LCD instrument cluster, then it goes back to a 2D mode until you're looking right back at it. Now this display is not as configurable as some of the other luxury displays that we see out there, especially the new Mercedes displays, and we don't get a full moving map display like we find in Audi products, but we do get well integrated side view cameras. We've seen those for a while from Genesis. And of course we do get turn by turn navigation displays in this LCD as well as the status of the vehicle's active safety systems. Let me know what you think about this steering wheel design down there in the comment section below. It definitely is different. I'm not sure exactly how I feel about sort of this shape right here in the middle, but I do like the fact that they've thought outside the box. We have sport grips up top, paddle shifters on the back, and then a lot of buttons on the front. We'll find the buttons for the infotainment system over here, track forward, backward, volume up, down, mode button, there's a favorite button and some phone buttons. And then on this side, we find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, the steering assist button right there for highway driving, and then the upper button changes what's displayed right there in that multifunction LCD. 
The barrage of buttons continues on the driver's side where we find a new button for the side view mirrors. Unfortunately, the G80 that they were able to send us was a very, very early pre-production vehicle, so it was not legal to drive out on the road. So I've only been able to drive the G80 in my driveway. Fortunately, it is on the long side as far as driveways go. However, it means that I know really very little about how the G80 accelerates, handles, how quiet it is, etc. That means that if you want to know my take on the G80 out on the road, be sure and hit that subscribe button down there, click that notification bell icon and enable all notifications because hopefully I will have the new G80 in production form in about a month so we can run it through our usual battery of tests and of course our complete comparison and review section. If you want to get your hands on a 2021 G80, they will be available in dealer showrooms in just a few months. We're told fall of 2020. And you won't have to bring as much cash with you as you might if you wanted a BMW or a Mercedes, because this is notably less expensive. It starts at $47,700 for the base 300 horsepower, 2.5 liter turbo four cylinder engine. We get a lot of standard equipment in that model, however, so not only is this less expensive than the Germans, but we have more content as well. It's also worth noting that we have more standard power in that model than entries like the Volvo S90 as well. We get that massive infotainment system standard in every model, but we do get one cost cutting measure for the base trim, and that is that we get an eight inch LCD instrument cluster, not the bigger 3D instrument cluster that we saw in this model. However, features like adaptive cruise control, the blind spot collision avoidance system, all that sort of stuff is standard on every trim. If you want all wheel drive, you left a pony at $50,850, with the same two and a half liter turbo. If you want the engine that's under this hood, which is the new three and a half liter twin turbo V6, that'll set you back $59,100. That's a very similar price point to the mid-level turbocharged engines that we find, for instance, in the BMW 5 Series, the 540i, or of course, the Mercedes-Benz E-Class. But again, we get more standard content on the G80 than we find in those alternatives. And if you want a fully loaded G80, that'll set you back just about $68,000, of course, before tax, title, and license. That would require that you got the 3.5 liter turbo, all wheel drive, the prestige package, and then a $400 bump on the metallic paint. Obviously, value continues to be a strong sales proposition for the Genesis brand, the G80 included. This is going to be at least $6,000 less than a BMW 5 Series. And I'm not talking about comparably equipped, I'm just talking base model to base model. Depending on how you want to equip your BMW to the Genesis right here, if you wanted similar features, you could be paying up to $12,000 more for the BMW than this Genesis right here. Of course, there is no corollary to the BMW M550i or the BMW M5 in the Genesis lineup at the moment. Although I was interested to see that this engine compartment has a lot of room in it. So theoretically, maybe there could be more powerful engines in Genesis's future. We just don't know exactly what that will be at this point. The value proposition appears to fade a little bit when you try and compare this twin turbocharged model to the BMW 540i. This is only going to be about $300 less expensive, but remember that we have thousands of dollars of standard equipment on the Genesis that we still don't find on that BMW M540i. That's why regardless of how you were to compare this to the BMW or the Mercedes-Benz E-Class, this is going to be thousands of dollars less expensive, and it's also going to have a longer standard warranty. The G90 is so aggressively priced that surprisingly enough, this is still going to be less expensive than other value entries like a Volvo S90 or an Audi A6 or an Infiniti Q70, which is positively ancient compared to this guy right here. In fact, the Q70 is so old that it really dates back to about the first generation of Genesis G80. At the moment, at least, bottom lining the G80 is pretty easy for me. In the past, I would have said that a G80 gives you 95% of the luxury experience for 80% of the price tag. But the calculus is clearly different in this generation of G80. Generation after generation, Genesis has gotten a lot closer to the European competition, and I truly believe that they have absolutely matched that in terms of interior quality, and I think in terms of exterior design as well. I know that some folks aren't really a big fan of this enormous grill here, but I will say it looks a little smaller in person. I think the combination of styling elements makes the grill look a bit bigger in photos. In person, I'm actually okay with this grill, and I think it certainly looks a lot better than what we find in the modern Lexus lineup. And in many ways, the G80 reminds me of what Lexus could have done if they had spent the time and the money in the Lexus GS. The GS went off to the sunset with a host of really nicely done engines, but none of them had the same kind of power or same kind of direct feel that we find under this hood for a similar price tag. Lexus was, of course, still trying to sell us a naturally aspirated 3.5 liter V6 in the GS, and that's just not as quick as the twin turbos that we find under this hood 
or under the hood of the European competition. And Genesis has proved that they can essentially match Lexus quality in their latest vehicles. If we take a look at the latest reliability and dependability metrics, Genesis is doing incredibly well. They may not be exactly where Lexus is at the moment, but they're certainly very, very close. There are definitely aspects of the Mercedes-Benz E-Class and the BMW 5 Series that I like, but I overall prefer this interior to the one that we find in the Audi A6 at the moment, and I think this compares incredibly well with the Mercedes, the BMW, and the Volvo S90, which all have really nicely done interiors. But of course, Genesis is giving you that for a much lower sticker price than all of those, including the Volvo S90 or the Infiniti Q70. But I think the biggest competitor for this is not the Lexus GS, which is again being discontinued. I think it's actually gonna be the Genesis GV80, which is right behind me, because it's only about $1,200 more than the G80, and I think its interior is actually a little bit nicer. If you haven't checked out my first look video on that GV80 right there behind me, then go ahead and check that video out because it should be on the channel right about the same time as the video that you're watching today. And if you want to know exactly how the G80 drives, then be sure and stay tuned because hopefully I will be able to get my hands on one of these right around August or September of 2020. So be sure and hit that subscribe button down there. Find us over at facebook.com slash alexnados, Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you later. And again, come back for the full drive review just as soon as I can.